Hi, I'm Steve Rothman with Rothman and Company. It's March 9, 2013, and today I'm going to talk about agreements among co-founders. So, basically, this is a situation where you have a group of people, two or more, who have decided to form a company, uh, some type of a business enterprise, but they're in the formative stages yet. They haven't really uh, they may not have formed a corporation or LLC. Actually, it doesn't matter whether they have or not. But they may not have. Uh, they may not have found financing yet. They may not have completely defined uh, everything about the company. But they know they want to work together, and it's time to start to put some things down on paper. And I call that a co-founders agreement. And I'm going to talk about what goes into a typical co-founders agreement, what's the purpose of it, um, and that's, that's basically it. So, uh, first of all, what are they and, and why do you have them? Well, it's like any other contract, so it's, it's a potentially a legally binding agreement among a group of people. Now, in fact, most of the time when people enter into a contract, it never gets enforced formally like by going to a court and asking a judge to enforce it. So I would say that preparing for a situation where a judge makes a decision about what a contract meant and what should be the outcome is not even the most important situation usually that you're preparing for in writing one, even though uh, there are some litigators that would argue with me about that, but they're not on this video, so I don't have to argue with them. Uh, and it certainly is one, one important thing, and it's always in the back of the mind of at least a lawyer who's working on a contract. But a contract is more than that, because in the many situations where you don't resort to the courts to resolve a dispute, you're still going to have conversations, you're going to have issues to work out between the different people that entered into the agreement, in this case between the different co-founders, and they may have differences of view. And if you can go back to a stage where you had all agreed, you had shared a vision, and you can say, you know, Bob, you had agreed that your job in our group was going to be to do X, and you haven't done X, and maybe there's a good reason for that, maybe there isn't, but we need to deal with that and there's different ways of dealing with it. it it could be that bob's equity stake is reduced because his production wasn't what it was supposed to be um, in an extreme case it could be that you don't want bob to be part of that group anymore um, so there's a bunch of things that you could do but at least if you can point to when you were all in agreement and say, this is what we agreed, and uh, therefore this ought to guide what we're going to do now. And that's really what you're trying to do uh, in a founder's agreement. So uh, that's, that's the purpose of it. Uh, you might ask, well, how does this interact with doing a business plan? Obviously, a business plan is much more detail, and it's not intended to be legally binding, and it covers a whole lot of different types of issues than the ones that we're about to talk about in terms of, you know, whether there's a market, what's the market size, what's the product going to look like, how are you going to get to the market, how are you going to protect your competitive position, things like that. There's all kinds of things that go into the business plan, but the founder's agreement is basically the relationships among the different founders and what their compensation is as they go through the process. So let me start to talk about what are some of the types of provisions that you would expect to see in a founder's agreement. The first would be one about roles and responsibilities. And obviously these can, most of these uh, things can vary from situation to situation, but uh, in one situation, you might want to say, okay, this person is going to be the chief executive officer, if that's, if that's the understanding. Or, uh, the role of this person is going to be to develop a prototype. Um, 
this person, everyone's expectation is that he's going to be, at this stage, working full-time on this project. Remember now, I'm talking about a stage at a company. There's typically a phase where you haven't really gotten off the ground yet, where the people that are working on it are, uh, are doing other things, unless they're independently wealthy. They might have other jobs. They might be working nights and weekends on this. They might be, you know, meeting nights in someone's garage to hatch this uh, venture. And uh, so there could be different expectations uh, that you might want to articulate about, well, how much time uh, are people putting in? Uh, is someone putting in full time if they're able to do that? Or if not, uh, are we meeting every Monday night for three hours and that's the extent of our uh, obligation? Or is this uh, more than that? Is it uh, something where it's our main outside activity other than our, our families and our whatever we're doing uh, to make a living. So you have some type of articulation of roles and responsibilities and who's doing what. And uh, that's important and it's going factor to factor into some of the other uh, provisions in the agreement. The next one is an example which is equity shares investing. Typically, when you're starting a company, one of the key questions among the founding group is how do you divide up the pie? Who gets what share of the equity? And I'm talking about among the founding group now. You're going to need to use equity to, depends on the type of venture, but you may need to use equity to raise money from investors who are going to be putting in cash that's needed and they're going to get some ownership in exchange for their cash. You may need equity for future employees, stock option plan, those kinds of things. But I'm talking about the founder group now, so let's say you have five people that are working together. Uh, is the split 20%, uh, 20%, 20%, you know, five times 20%, or is one person gets 50% and then uh, others get different amounts? And obviously it needs to relate to what they're bringing to the table in terms of whose idea was it. Uh, what uh, experience do they have, uh, how much of the work are they expected to do, uh, those are some of the things you'd be looking at. But you're going to be trying to decide a fair way to divide up the pie that everyone's happy with and that they feel that, or at least not unhappy with, uh, and that they feel that um, people are being compensated fairly in relation to the efforts they're putting in. If you can't get there, there's probably no, not much point in going much further uh, if, if you can't reach agreement on, on that because it's going to lead to tensions down the road. Uh, a footnote about vesting. You may be familiar with vesting, but I think I better touch on it for those who aren't completely familiar with it. So the basic idea of vesting is that you are assigned a certain number of shares of stock or a certain uh, percentage interest in a limited liability company, but you don't really own it until you've worked for the company for a certain period of time. Um, in a typical situation where someone who's a non-founder joins a company, uh, that vesting period would be four years. So if you're granted a thousand shares, you really own 250 shares at the end of the first year, uh, 500 shares at the end of the second year, 750 at the end of the third year, and 1,000 at the end of the fourth year. And if you leave the company during the first year of your employment, you walk away without any equity. Um, in Silicon Valley, it tends to be a little bit different. The most standard uh, situation is that you have again the one year, what's called a one year cliff, which means that if you don't continue to provide services for one year, you walk away without any equity. But then after that, you have monthly vesting, usually 136 uh, per month of what's the remaining amount, so that at the end of four years you'd be fully vested. Uh, it can be different for founders who are bringing to the company particularly if they're bringing to the company inventions or valuable IP. Uh, there would be a negotiation over the vesting. Maybe they are 50% vested immediately on the day that they join the company and the rest vests over two years. But I'm kind of making up the numbers and it's going to depend on the situation and, and negotiations. Um, 
So the other thing about vesting that I'm not really going to fully explain here because it's not uh, critical is what are the circumstances in which you would forfeit the unvested shares. So in a, it's frequently the case that well, certainly if you quit uh, and leave then you walk away from whatever portion of your equity uh, was unvested. Um, in some circumstances you might have a provision where if your employment is terminated not by the employee but by the company uh, and not for cause but just for convenience basically uh, then the vesting of the equity would accelerate uh, there's another category another set of circumstances where the company acts in such a way uh, which makes you miserable enough that you have to quit uh, and then that's treated as if you had been fired rather than if you had quit and that's typically known as a termination for good reason and that's also a situation in which in some uh, transaction documents you would be able to vest in the equity that would have vested had you remained throughout your employment even though you weren't there the whole time. These types of vesting Provisions are very familiar in the setting where you have professional investors, VCs, sometimes angels, coming into the company and putting in money. And clearly what they want is they do not want to invest their money into the company and then find out that the people they invested in are gone. So the purpose of the provisions in part is to tie the people to the company. Um, there's also another side to it, which is that if people who were expected to be founders and to play an important role in the company leave, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then uh, it usually becomes necessary to replace them, which means that you have to give an equity incentive to the new person, and if you don't get any equity back from the ones who left, then you end up with everyone being diluted in their percentage ownership, so another reason for having uh, vesting restrictions is that if you do end up having to replace people, um, it doesn't reduce the equity stake of uh, all those others that, that remain. Uh, so anyway, typically one sees vesting type restrictions being imposed in conjunction with a financing in which professional investors are putting money into a company. Now, there's no reason why you can't do something like that before you bring in professional investors who force you to do it. The professional investors ask you to do that because they don't want to invest their money and then find out that the people that they've invested in have, have left. But um, as a group of founders, you also don't want to invest large amounts of your time in a venture uh, only to find out that someone else who you've given partial ownership of that venture isn't doing what everyone expected him uh, to do. So one way to deal with that is vesting and the vesting it doesn't have to be four years, it can be short and there's a pros and cons of different ways of doing it. But it's the se second thing that you ought to deal with in the founders agreement. So first we've got roles and responsibilities, equity shares and vesting is the second. Third is cash contributions and or requirements. So Typically, again, I'm talking about a relatively early stage of forming a business and I'm talking about a situation in which I'm assuming that the founders aren't rolling in money. If they're rolling in money, it might be a somewhat different situation, but still, there may be some cash requirements. But typically, at some point, you're going you're gonna to do a business plan and you're going to go out and you're going to raise money, hopefully, uh, that's going to take you down the longer road to where you want to be. But in the initial stages, you know, maybe there's a few flights to New York required, or maybe somebody's got to build a prototype and needs to pay for parts. Uh, maybe there's one member of the group who, um, you know, it's really tough, tougher for them than for the others to take time away from their regular work. And there's a question of whether uh, they would even get some cash uh, out even before you raised a major financing. That would be relatively unusual. But uh, the point I'm making is that if there's any expectation that um, 
cash is going to be needed before you've raised large amounts of it, then you should have an understanding among yourselves of uh, where's it coming from and in what proportions, which don't need, which can be, but don't need to be the same as the purport the equity shares uh, uh, generally. Uh, so okay, so we've covered three things: roles and responsibilities, equity shares investing, cash contributions and cash requirements. And then the next I want to talk about is decision making. How are you going to make decisions? Now, once you form a company, which you can do before, after, or simultaneous with this process I'm describing of the Founders Agreement, but once you do that, there will be um, some formalities. If it's a corporation, you usually have a board of directors. If it's a limited liability company, you would usually, you can have it, it can be member managed or manager managed. You can have a board of managers. You can call it a board of directors if you want. Uh, but the basic issues are the same, which are uh, who's going to make day to day decisions? And what about the bigger decisions? Do you want to have a separate class? So uh, maybe, for example, in your group, uh, you can maybe there's five of you, and maybe you can agree we're going to have a board of three, and these are going to be the three, and they're going to make all the decisions. And hopefully you can do things by consensus. But if you get into a situation where there isn't complete agreement, then the decision of a majority of these three is going to bind. That's just an example. I'm not suggesting you have to do it that way. There's lots of ways of doing it, uh, but that's one way to approach things you could, within that framework, have a board that is going to be authorized to make most decisions, but still reserve some fundamental decisions that would require unanimity. Um, requiring unanimity is a little bit dangerous because it's not unusual for along the line of getting from starting out to becoming a success that there will be some disagreement uh, about uh, how to proceed. And if you have, for example, five founders and they all have to agree uh, and one of them doesn't agree, it can, and, and that can, uh, you've agreed that everything will be unanimous, um, you can be stuck uh, where it's difficult to move forward. Uh, so if you're going to have uh, agreements that require more than a majority, say, uh, I would uh, try to limit them, make them big issues, and, and you still might not want to make it unanimous. Maybe you need four out of five, for example, in, uh, for certain types. And those would typically be things like abandoning the venture, uh, making a major shift in focus where you're, you know, you're totally changing the product or starting over, or you, know, you had originally decided that you were going to do this project as a lean funded uh, bootstrap type uh, venture and now you've decided that you're going to go approach large venture capital firms and try to raise five to ten million dollars. I mean those are kind of major shifts in direction. So you may want to have a list of things that would require more, uh, require a supermajority. Uh, the next issue I want to touch on is intellectual property assignments. Uh, these would be agreements among the founders that inventions and other types of intellectual property that they come up with in the course of working together are all assigned to the venture. And if you've set up a corporation or an LLC or some other kind of entity, that's who would they, they would be assigned to. If you haven't set up an entity, you would at least have as part of the Founders in Agreement, an obligation on the part of all the participants to assign to that entity when it's formed. Um, now, some of these things you may be kind of recognizing as terms that you've seen in other agreements. So, for example, if you do, if you've ever been involved in a venture-backed startup, you will know that as one of the closing conditions to the financing documents, all of the probably all the employees, certainly all the founders and significant people are going to be expected to sign what are usually called employee proprietary information and assignment agreements, but they're, they're basically intellectual property assignments. Um, so you might ask, why do I have to deal with that now? 
uh, why, why is that part of the founders agreement and how does that relate to this other document that I would be asked to sign if and when I got to the point of doing a financing. Um, well, you may not be there yet, right? You may not, there's going to be a significant period of time, typically from conception of the business idea to when it's baked enough for you to go out and, and raise money and do a financing. And during all that time, you're going to be working together with these other people. Uh, how would you feel if one of them decided he didn't like the group, went off on his own, started what looks a heck of a lot like the same company, and was using something that was arguably your idea. Uh, now, I don't want to get into a long discussion of intellectual property here and the different types and what sorts of ideas you can own and what you can't. And we have patentable, patentable inventions and non-patentable inventions. And we have um, trade secrets and we have copyrightable subject matter. And there's all different kinds. But uh, suffice to say that I think it would make sense at an early stage rather than a later stage of working with a group of people on founding a company to have an agreement that intellectual property that grows out of your work together is for the group uh, to either to use or to, to dispose of. So next and related to that uh, I want to mention confidentiality agreements. Uh, I think that in order for you to have trade secret protection for any ideas that come out of your collaboration, you would need to protect them with confidentiality agreements. Again, that's something that you would typically be asked to sign anyway down the line at some point, maybe by an investor, uh, maybe by other third parties that you're doing business with, but there's no reason to wait until then. And in fact, you, you don't want to wait until then you want to enter into confidentiality agreements as part of the Founders Agreement so that you know that you can all speak freely and that uh, no one is going to go talk about uh, ideas that you have for the business outside the group, at least without group permission. Uh, next item is competition. Here the law is going to vary to some extent. Uh, I'm speaking from the United States where I'm licensed to practice law in California, Florida, and Massachusetts, and there are different laws in those states, and I'm not going to get into it in comprehensive detail, but in particular in California there are fairly restrictive provisions on non-competition agreements. So for example, if an employee is uh, required as a condition of employment to sign an agreement that says that once he leaves a company's employment he will never compete with it. Uh, that's generally not going to be valid. Even if he signed it, he wouldn't, the company wouldn't be able to enforce it. So there could be uh, issues that you have to deal with state by state, but generally speaking, if you're forming a group uh, to try to find a new venture. Again, you're probably assuming that one of you or two of you or some subset isn't going to go off and compete uh, with the rest. And you probably want to uh, get that in writing, but you may need to put some parameters around it. I mean, what if the venture doesn't take off? I mean, you could never uh, enter into that uh, business on your own or except through this group. Probably not. So maybe there's some time period associated with it. And as I said, you may have to deal with the state law issues. Uh, but that's the next issue is competition. Uh, the next one I want to touch on is maybe the most nebulous and uh, not that easy, but still I think worth dealing with in the agreement. And that is your vision for the company. Um, there's lots of different reasons for forming a different company, for forming a company and lots of different uh, approaches to them. Uh, some companies are lifestyle companies and they're really formed by people because they want to work together, they don't want to go work for a big corporation, uh, they want to start something of their own, but maybe getting rich isn't very high on the list of, uh, of the motivations and the people who work there. Maybe they want to have a balanced lifestyle, maybe they want to get to know their kids or whatever. Uh, for other people, Starting a company is all about, you know, reaching the top and making a lot of money. Um, for some people, starting a company is about creating something that's going to go on and last uh, 
maybe last uh, longer than them, uh, and they want to, uh, they view it like a baby and they want to keep control of it and they want to keep it in place. For other people, it might be about doing what we call a quick flip, where you start a company, nobody else thought of it before, you get it going, you prove that it can work, you operate it for a couple of years, and then you go out and sell it, and you make a lot of money and you move to Tahiti. Those are really different uh, visions for what you want to do with your company. Uh, one isn't right and the other one wrong, but you're heading for a train wreck if some of you want to do a quick flip and others want to build the next uh, Microsoft uh, and you're trying to work together and you haven't even identified that as an issue. So I think it's something that ought to be discussed. Whether it should be in the Founders Agreement, I, I would put it in the optional category and that's partly because I think it's, it's difficult to define with precision what you're going to do. Uh, you can put provisions in an agreement and then say that they're they're non-binding. The agreement's supposed to be binding except for these provisions. So maybe that's the way of dealing with it here. One compromise would be to have a vision section but say that it's non-binding. So you're not going to take somebody's stock away if, or uh, have some other remedy if uh, it turns out that, that you have a difference of view down the road from what people originally thought about this. But it's a it's a good subject to talk about and it's a way, a way of, of getting you to talk about it and getting to see if you have a consensus and if you have a consensus get it in writing would be to put it into the Founders Agreement. So I have two more issues uh, to cover. We've covered most of the big, the big ones. Uh, the last two are dispute resolution and amendment. In any contract you need uh, to think a little bit about what's going to happen down the road if you have a dispute. Uh, if you say nothing about it, what that means in effect, at least in the United States, is that uh, if there's a dispute and you want to get someone else to resolve it, it's going to be a court. It's, it's going to go to a court and you're going you're gonna to have a lawsuit. Uh, that's expensive. It can be, some people think it's a good way to resolve disputes in terms of uh, precise following of what the original contract said. Um, but it may or may not be the right thing for your group. Uh, you may be able, you might want to have a custom dispute resolution mechanism built into your agreement from the start. Most common is just to have an arbitration, which isn't that custom. You can just say, uh, you know, if we have a dispute, it's going to go to the American Arbitration Association or whatever. But there can be much more creative things. There may be uh, someone who is not part of the founding group but is an advisor and is held in great esteem by all of the members as to that person's fairness. And uh, you might want to say that, you know, if there's a dispute down the road, Joe Advisor is going to make the decision for us as to uh, what the outcome is going to be and we're all going to respect it. That's going to save you a lot of money in uh, legal fees. It may or may not get to you to a resolution that any particular individual thinks is the most fair outcome, uh, but it's something to think about. And then last is amendment. Um, I'm not a big one uh, when drafting legal agreements for a lot of what we lawyers call boilerplate, which means all of the fine print that comes in at the end of the contract, uh, but you do need to touch on the subject of amendment. That is to say, circumstances change and what are you going to do if the agreement that seemed like a good agreement, it doesn't seem like a good agreement anymore uh, and short of just fighting it out, uh, are you going to be able to modify it to reflect changing times? And the basic issue is if you say nothing, again, then it requires unanim unanimity to amend it. So that would mean that everybody who signed the original agreement would have to be a party to an amendment. Uh, you can do that. You can require, uh, you know, 75% uh, of the original members. The reason for doing that, again, is that if one member of the group kind of starts to act a little crazy on you, uh, it's, uh, if you have a super majority, that's usually enough uh, protection in most people's minds that they're not going to be treated unfairly. Uh, but uh, so you might want to you might want to have a amendment just by a majority. Uh, 
you might want to have amendment by unanimous judgment, but then that runs the risk that uh, one person can kind of hold up the whole uh, venture if everyone else agrees that we ought to go in a different uh, direction. They don't. So, uh, so those are the basic issues that I think a founders agreement should cover. So to recap briefly, they're the roles and responsibilities of the members, uh, their equity shares, their ownership, and how those will vest, if they will vest over time, uh, whether th the founders are expected to put in any cash, and if so, how much and when, uh, how decisions are going to be made by the group, will you have a board of directors, and, and if so, will there be some fundamental decisions that will require more than the board uh, to, to make them that requ require unanimous decision. Uh, intellectual property assignments by each of the founders to the venture or a commitment to make those assignments once you have a formal corporation, LLC or other entity formed. Confidentiality commitments so that uh, what's spoken as part of the planning process uh, is kept within the group. Uh, possibly non-competition agreements among the founders. Uh, a statement of the vision for the company. It could be a short statement. Again, I'm not talking about something business plan length, but uh, kind of some type of view as to where where you're trying to go with this. You're going to be you all going to be around for five years, or are you looking for a quick in out, or those types of issues. Uh, how are you going to resolve a disputes that uh, arise along the way? And finally, what's the process with a minimum hassle for amending the agreement uh, if you need to do that? So that's my take on Founders Agreements. Uh, the reason to have them is basically to see that everyone is pulling in the same direction in the boat, get clear from the start that you have a basis for working together to form a company because you have a common vision. And assuming you do, put that common vision down on paper while you're all friends so that if things get a little rocky down the road, uh, you have a charter to refer back to, to say, I mean, in, in the, to put it in the most negative light, maybe to say, Joe, you said you were going to do this, you didn't do that, so now, you know, how are you going to make it up to us? But it can be more just a question of, hey, this, we come back to our basic charter to uh, start from a position of our agreement and decide how we're going to deal with uh, new situations that come up as they inevitably do. So this has been Steve Rothman from Rothman and Company We're talking about co-founder agreements. It's March 9, 2013. I hope you found this useful and I wish you luck with your new venture.